All right. Welcome, Susan. We, we haven't started yet, but uh, yeah. So again, typically we um, converse through the chat. Uh, if you want to talk, that's okay too. But I think it's just something that we just found that this, this, this format works for some reason. So uh, let us take a moment of silence together. And let's do that by, uh, we do this because uh, it, it's hard to switch our mind to um, God mode, if you will. And uh, so we're just gonna take a moment of silence and um, see if we can bring ourselves back into this place and, and this time and allow our brain to understand that we are about to embark in a um, spiritual journey, okay? So let us take a moment of silence and stillness. Let us pray together at this time, asking God to help us to love our enemies. And uh, this is not an emotional love, but volitional uh, acts of charity. And, and we're, we're asking God that he will empower us to not only love those who love us and, and those who we like, but also those that we don't like and those that may even hate us and hurt us in the past so we're, we're asking God to help us with that we're admitting today that we don't have will or desire or power to love our enemies so in trust we pray let us pray that God um, give me strength to do that you help me with that because it's not in me to do Father, we confess before you that we don't want to forgive people because we're hurt and we feel that there's some injustice and offense that have been taking place. And we keep running over these scenarios in our head where we justify that we are, we're good, that our person is bad, and what they have done is terrible. And, um, we are victims of injustice or some sort of offense. Uh, uh, I, I think it's a necessary step that we name all the hurts and pains. But as we name them and as we express our dislike uh, or even hatred for the other person, we're also looking for ways to forgive because uh, you have forgiven us. And we know that uh, we can't live with hate and we can't live with unresolved issues in our life. So God, I pray that you will help us with that because we're helpless against hate. We're helpless against uh, our enemies. You open our eyes today, God, that slowly, uh, one day, that we will able to uh, love even those that have, uh, even those that um, hate us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, men, men. Okay, I'm going to share a link with you. And it's a little bit lengthier, but please read the text 
I'm going to give you five minutes until I guess probably till 718, but don't worry about that. I'll, I'll call you back into the meeting. And um, I want you to look at, just read a story and see, um, is this something that is possible in my own life? And why does Elisha do this when uh, Syrians are clearly his enemies? And um, yeah, I just want you to pick out uh, as many things as you can and um, immerse yourself in the story, see yourself in the story and see why, what you would have done differently or what you would have done, period. Okay, so yeah, let's come back at 7.18 and I'll, yeah, I'll talk to you soon.
All right. Yeah, if you yeah, if you're a fast reader, you can you can read read the text over and over again if it's short enough. But usually, the way that you want to read it is use your imagination, see yourself in the story, and also ask a lot of questions. Um, what does that mean? What would I do that? Uh, why did he do that? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So. Be curious, imaginative and curious as you read the text. That will really help you to get into the story. Uh, let's talk about some of the things that you notice in the text. And today we're gonna to do something a little bit different than usual, okay? So what kind of questions do you have or what kind of interesting things do you notice in the text tonight? Oh, uh, a very good question. Which king was ruling? And they deliberately uh, omit that out. So we don't know which king this is. So it could it could be the same king um, of Assyria, or Syria, I should say, uh, as the bottom. Uh, which verse is it? I, I, can never pronounce any of these names. Uh, ben Haddad, it could be him or or not, but they deliberately take that out, or it doesn't reveal which king it is. Okay, what are some of the strange things that you notice in here, other than the the miracle? Elisha is bringing Syrian art, the Syrian army to uh, Samaria, not Syria. Samaria and Samaria, as you know, is the capital city of uh, northern, the Northern Kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> Eating of the sons. Yeah, I, I don't want to focus too much on that. To, I didn't want to focus, focus too much on that today, but yeah, eventually the siege gets so severe. I mean, uh, we're under lockdown, but siege is something different altogether. Nobody's coming in and out. So there's lack of food in Samaria and people are making deals. Like, I'll eat, we'll, eat your we'll boil your baby today and we will boil mine tomorrow. So that's how desperate they were. They're resorting to cannibalism. Yeah, there is a big significance in telling uh, on telling how much donkey's head and dove's dung cost. And yeah, does anybody want to take a stab at eating these things? So I'll, I'll just wait for someone to comment on that. Uh, why why that is significant? Because you know they're they're omitting the name of the king, but they are at the same time. Quoting the price of these things, so there, there's some significance here. Why didn't they kill the army instead of fed them and let them go back? And that's what we're trying to figure out today. But it's it becomes easier if you read the whole different stories that's happening um, prior to this story. And that's one of the things that I, I want to cover tonight, that you can't just look at one story and figure out the answer. Uh, you have to read the stories that come before it because you know stories have, they don't, they're not happening in, in bubbles, they're happening in chain. So we'll, we'll talk about that tonight. Like, why, do, why don't they kill them? Why feed them, you know? Like, uh, oh, so Samaria is a city within Northern, yeah, that's right. Is a Northern, is, is a capital of Northern Israel. So Southern Kingdom capital is Jerusalem and Samaria is for uh, North. It's not outside of Israel, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, Kelly is practical. Um, the siege got so bad that the trash was costly. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Trash was costly for sure. Yeah, there's a there's a dramaticness of like, you know, 
that people have to, uh, things that are so bad, drastic, that people have to eat their own kids. Um, yeah, King of Israel really wanted to kill them. He asked twice. He is very excited. <laughs> yeah, he really, really wanted to kill them. Um, because one, well, they're enemies, and two, um, it seems like it's a quite a quite the size. Uh, it, it's a large army that uh, King of Syria has sent, so it could deal a, a great blow to their uh, human supply. So, wh why do you think, um, like, what kind of animal is donkey? Yeah, he does want to eat them, although that is very practical of you. Yeah, they're a work animal, uh, but also they're not a kosher animal. They're they're not, yeah, like same reason they don't, uh, the reason that they don't eat, um, like they're like pigs, they, they don't eat it. It's, it's not part of their diet. Uh, and the least, like when was last time you and I had a, um, ox head delight we never do like we never see any meat that comes from the head because there's so little of it and it's not appetizing but the least valuable part of a donkey is being sold for a great price it's, it's not kosher it's the least wanted part but it's expensive because the situation is so dire and dung also the same thing well you know typically most cultures don't eat a dung excrement from an animal, uh, but especially for Jewish people because they will be ceremonially unclean if they eat this. Yeah, they'll be ceremonial, ceremonially unclean anyway. So yeah, they they don't eat that stuff, and but they're desperate. Their worship of God or whatever else. Uh, their feeling of feeling and loyalty toward God is just gone. Well, it was gone to begin with, but it's just worse. So it's, it's a cultural, even culturally, they're losing their identity. Okay, um, what do you think? Uh, hmm, maybe I should move on. What do you think about the fact that um, Elijah took them or the Syrian army followed Elijah while well, even though they're blind. And, and then to quote, um, I will take you, let's see. Elijah said to them, this is not the way and this is not the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. What do you think about that? Now imagine yourself, you're, you're a soldier, you're blinded, and you're on a mission. You can't see a thing. And somebody comes and says, well, uh, come with me. I'll take you to a, a nearby town. Why do you think Syrian soldiers followed Elijah? And we don't know the answer. We're just kind of thinking out loud. You don't have choice, you're prisoners of war. Okay, so they may have felt that they are already defeated. Okay. They trusted him, possibly. And just like Israelites were eating donkeys and, and bird poo, uh, they were desperate perhaps, right? So they had to trust somebody. They needed guidance. But don't you find it interesting that uh, Elijah says, um, I'll take you to the person that you seek. What does that tell you? Though they were blind, their uh, blind, their eyes were open to the fact that they were blind only was only because God and they feared him. Yeah, there, there is definitely, um, 
interesting thing there where they, they can't see, but what they see is a person that they seek. And yeah, <laughs> I shall lie. Well, yes and no, but more no, because they do find the person that they were seeking. Um, so let, let's think about this. Who were they after? I mean, they were after Elijah, but in their mind, they never seen Elijah before. In their mind, what is Elijah like? Like, what is he to them? Yeah, he knew that he was a prophet. Informer, yeah. Possibly a guy for Israel. But ultimately, yeah, well, traitor, but he's an enemy, right? He, he belongs on the other side of the camp. He's advising Israel, uh, king of Israel. And therefore, they're coming to take out, um, I don't know, the head of CIA. You know, who cares he's a prophet? He, he's informing, um, and their, their men, their friends are dying. So they're here to kill that guy. So even though they're blind, when, they, when they're given the offer of option of finding this guy, they're willing to go. So perhaps they're willing to carry out their mission right to the end. Yeah. And so, um, but what kind of, what kind of person was Elijah when they actually do open their eyes? Like Grace said, like when God opens their eyes, how is Elijah different from Elijah they had in, my, in their mind when they left camp in Syria? They left Syria thinking uh, Elijah was this, but they came and discovered that he is actually that. He was gracious and did not treat them like an enemy. He, he treated them like something else. He saved their lives. Yeah, he was gracious to them. and. Like visitors, yeah, because hospitality is big, right? So he treated them as uh, visitors. And also he, uh, when Israel's king said, let's kill them, can we kill them, can we kill them? It's almost like a puppy, like, can we keep them, can we keep them? Um, he says, would you kill your captor? You know, prisoners of war, would you kill them? I mean, that did happen. Uh, Assyrians did it all the time. <laughs> But he's saying, you know, you wouldn't do that. So he treated them like visitors. He treated them like friends, and then they sent them back home. So uh, what I what I want to tell you there is, um, your image of God might be very different from who He actually is. Uh, especially when you can't forgive somebody, and you're not loving your enemy, and and you you're, you feel like you're floundering in your faith. Um, who is God to you? What is the image of God in that place? And it might be that he's very judgmental. He's looking at you saying, well, I love my enemies. I loved you. Uh, how come you can't love other people that have hurt you? But I, I, I will, I, I think um, you will find him very different if you pray. That he is not actually, uh, I mean, he might be like really challenging you and say, you know, like, you need to do this. But I, I'm willing to bet that he is quite different from what you might think of him. Um, so one of the things that, what are the things that Elijah do in this text? And it, what are some of the repeated things that he does in this story? Should I go? Yeah, verse 17. Um, 
and, and that gets repeated throughout the story. And one of the core theme, uh, one of the core themes in this story. What does Elijah do when he encounters his enemy? Yeah, he prays, he prays and prays. Oh, we got two pray, two answers. Yeah, and they're identical. He prays. So here, here's what I'm suggesting to you. Uh, if you pray to God in the moment where you are facing your enemy, uh, I, I'll, I'll bet you, um, you will encounter God very differently. So whenever you're in this tight bind, uh, instead of you trying to do something about it and say, you know, I know what I must, must do. Uh, I, I want to encourage you to pray and pray so that uh, in this story, when he prays, one, he gets the, the enemies get blinded. Two, uh, his servants open uh, his eyes and sees the chariots of fire and horses. And three, uh, the enemies open their eyes again. Okay, and then when Elijah speaks to uh, his his people, he does so only to save. So it is an interesting thing um, that his words have uh, life-giving kind of tendencies and, and redeeming tendencies. Although he lied. <laughs> um, so I why does I think I think somebody asked I, I think it was Kelly why does he forgive instead of killing them. Uh, and we can easily go into the ideal of, yeah, because he, he loves he loves his people. And, and there are a lot of fruitful things to think about along that line of uh, train of thought. But you have to compare him to Elijah and how he deals with soldiers. And I won't get into that. If you're interested, just go back to the uh, beginning of Second King. And uh, I, I think it starts from chapter two or, or three and see how he deals with soldiers. There's a contrast there. And, and, and God is doing something new through Elisha. So now, um, what I wanted to do with you tonight is I wanna ask you, who do you relate to, relate to most out of all the people in this, or characters in this story? Is it Elisha? Or you feel like, I'm ready to move on. I'm ready to forgive. And um, their sense of like confidence and boldness. It's not forced. Like I, I relate to him. Okay, there's somebody in my life. And I, and, and I feel just, I feel like Elijah today. Or I've been feeling it. Um, or two, do you feel like the servant who's afraid um, yet? And, and he, he can't see the chariots of fire that outnumbers the chariots of Syrian army. Are you like the king of Israel who is like, yay, opportunity, you know, um, I, I can do some damage to my enemies today. Or are you more like the Syrian soldiers um, and, and you feel like you've, you've been hurting people and it's not justified and you feel convicted about that? Okay. And I, I feel convicted sometimes, like I, I'm too strict on my kids, or that wasn't fair. I, you know, I last at you. I'm sorry. You know, like things like that happen. So it, that could be you. Okay. So let's think about that. I, I want to actually let's pray together, and see which uh, character that we identify with the most. Okay. I'm going to give you two minutes to pray.
Okie dokie. So let's share. You don't have to get into details, but um, who do you identify most in this story? And if you want to share why, you know, feel free to do that, but you don't have to. The king of Israel, I want to eliminate the problem. I, I identify with that. The servant, you need to have your eyes open. Okay, another one for servant. Mix of all of them depends on the day. Like Metamucil, no wait, that's not it. Like one of those cereals that has everything. Oh, that's a, that's the, yeah, I, I I hear you. A servant also, I often feel outnumbered. Yeah. Yeah, it's overwhelming. When you, <laughs> it's first thing in the morning too, right? You're coming out, <laughs> boiling some water for some coffee, and. You got all these chariots and soldiers and with shiny pointy objects. Yeah, it is overwhelming. Life can be so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Mm, okay, I'll, I'll, I assume that some of you are thinking about it or some of you just rather keep it to yourself and that is perfectly fine. Um, but I, I want to end tonight with this thought. You know how Elijah says, well, let me just not make it up. Maybe I can. Uh, Elijah said in verse 16, he said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Um, let me share that screen with you, although it's not really necessary. Let's just do it. Verse 16, where are we? Okay, and he said, do not be afraid. Um, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. So Elijah prayed, and the Lord opened his eye, opened the eyes of the servant. And this reminds me of 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Um, and, and John says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So Elijah's, just as Elijah's confidence is coming from the fact that there are more, those who are with us are more, therefore you do not have to fear. Our chariots of fire is Christ himself, that he is greater than um, those in the world. And, and that's not just referring to men in this text specifically is it, the devil and, and Satan, like the darkness, the forces of darkness. So we are able to love our enemies, not because we are, you know, whatever, that we are loving and we are mature and we'll grow into it. it it's none of that. It's really none of that. That you figure something out about the other person and now you're more understanding. Well, I mean, that can help, but, but what we're saying is, Christ is greater in me, and he is working in me to see that, um, that I am not a victim in this scenario, although that's what you are trying to do. Like, you can victimize me, that's a verb. Like, I can be victimized, and, and, and I can really, um, you know, sympathize if I, you know, I have compassion on myself, if I'm, if I'm sympathized, but ultimately I'm not a victim and that's a noun. Because see that it's, I, I'm not defined by you. I'm defined by a Christ who's in me. 
So, um, you know, I, I wanted you to read this for yourself. And I don't know if I'm communicating too much here, but Elijah, when he encounters soldiers, he burns them up. He just gets, dispatches them. He just gets rid of them. And Elijah is another prophet, a mentor of Elisha, which we're dealing with right now. Uh, and, and Jesus, when he was captured on the night of betrayal, Peter takes out the sword and, you know, chops up the servant's uh, Malchus, his ear off. And Jesus says, don't you know that, you know, I can uh, appeal to my father and the father will send 12 legions of army to rescue me. And each one legion equals 4,000 to 6,000 soldiers. So, you know, that's a lot of soldiers, right? Um, but he doesn't. He ultimately doesn't. It, Jesus really does turn the other cheek. And I, th this is what is at our disposal, that we don't have to live like the world. We don't have to participate in the darkness because Christ is in us. And, and, and this, believe it or not, will come natural to us when we understand that Christ is in us and he is greater than anything else that is in the world. Uh, fortunately, today, um, on Sunday, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about reconciliation through the story of Jonah, and we'll get deeper into that. But um, yeah, we'll wrap it up here today. Okay, let us pray. Father, we are outnumbered, and it's really hard for us to love our enemies and to bless them, but we're learning that we don't have to live like our enemies, that we don't have to resort to same type of choices and lifestyle, and that we are looking for that day when you give us such a boldness and confidence that we can act in love. It's not an emotional thing. It's, it's a volitional thing that we can, and, and therefore we can represent. Um, they, they came to, you know, just like Elijah in, in the minds of Syrian soldiers was an enemy, but what, what's been revealed to them is that he's a wonderful host. And God, I pray that um, that's what the world will discover, that you, you may treat me like, you know, although I may be treated like an enemy, I can still act as a host. And that I can love the world and I can serve the world. Because if I'm just waiting for a perfect world where everyone loves me and everyone likes me, uh, then I, I will never be a host. I will never able to really love and serve because that will never really happen. So God, I open our eyes and see, the, see you inside of us who is greater than, uh, who outnumbers and who is greater than he that is in the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen, men, men. So good to have you, Cheryl. I I hope you're.